Living Room Logic. Welcome back to Season 2 of Living Room Logic. This episode, Andrew racks the brain of mind expert Dr. Daniel Jolly, who delves into the psychology behind conspiracy theories and those who believe in them. Keep the earth round by following or subscribing to us wherever you get your podcasts and check out Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at Living Room Logic to join our logical following. This season is supported by FameLab, the world's biggest science communication competition, which is celebrating its ninth and final year in Ireland. We'd love it if you tuned into the national final, which takes place on the 30th of September. After all, without them, I might not have bugged Aidan to the point of making a podcast with me. Enjoy this conversation and conspire safely. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, Welcome back to another episode of Living Room Logic. And this week we're spoiled to have a conversation with a psychologist who speaks to those who believe in conspiracies and studies the way that conspiracies impact our lives. Dr. Daniel Jolly, could you please introduce yourself? Well, indeed, I'm Dr. Daniel Jolly. I'm a senior lecturer at Northumbria University, based in Newcastle upon Tyne. Now, my research interest is understanding our weird and wacky brain that we have, in essence, which conspiracy theory fit perfectly into that kind of realm. So I'm interested to understand why so many people believe in conspiracies, and indeed, actually, are they harmful? If someone believes in a conspiracy, is that a harmful thing? And if it is harmful, what can we do about it? Are there tools or interventions that can be used to reduce the impact of conspiracy narratives? That's kind of my interest, which is interest, which of course is the topic of today's podcast. That's great, yeah. And it's very, very interesting. And oh my, isn't it a hot topic for you? I'd say the last two years has been spicy. I'd say you've gotten questions and emails from students, questions and emails from news outlets, and probably the occasional anti with the occasional question as well. Um, But I think just to define it before we go into it properly is what exactly are conspiracy theories? You know, I I think we hear it being thrown around a lot, but what are conspiracy theories? And are they a a recent thing? Is it just kind of of the new age or were they around longer? So there are different ways to define a conspiracy. I'm sure listeners now have their own kind of interpretation, their own kind of gut feeling what a conspiracy is. The one that I go with is trying to explain large events or issues as the secret actions of a powerful group of people, which means that the key ingredients for me are there. It's about trying to explain something big Mm-hmm. climate change, vaccines, of course. Something, something sinister. And it's explaining it as a secret plot by a powerful group. Then that powerful group can be a whole range of different groups. It could be the government or scientists, or it could be groups that we find threatening, such as minority groups. This kind of definition kind of works to explain conspiracies that have existed throughout time, but also ones that are more contemporary. Which indeed, to go back to your, your second question, Conspiracy beliefs have been around since arguably the start of time. In essence, it's us pointing the finger and blaming important things on shady characters. So explaining, for example, Jewish people for plots and schemes, that that, rather they're involved in plots and schemes, saying that they're involved in Hollywood, etc, etc. This is a conspiracy belief that has existed for quite some time. But even just thinking back to, you know, in more recent memory, to do with the the assassination of JFK, which is a conspiracy, suggesting that it wasn't a lone gunman, but rather it was a government conspiracy, Mm -hmm. moving, you know, towards climate change, anti-vaccine rhetoric, trick that has existed for quite some time and of course over the last two years COVID-19 conspiracy theories suggesting that it was made purposely by a government to the idea that it was 5G that 5G is the cause of COVID-19 and each of these examples that I've mentioned all fit that kind of definition that you're explaining a large event or issue by a powerful group. Mm, that does make a lot of sense and I guess I would wonder is, is it the fact that maybe we have things like Twitter and we have things like Facebook and stuff that maybe we're more likely to see this? Or is it that there's a lot more people who believe in it? Because it, I'm really not entirely sure. So is there any like, uh, do you have any idea about that? 
It's a, it's a real, real good question. And I suppose the question is also, has the internet been a flourishing ground for conspiracy theories? Mm. On the one hand, yes, I agree that they, as you say, they're more accessible potentially. But these beliefs, as I've mentioned, have actually been around for a very long time, way before the internet. Thinking back to the JFK conspiracies, suggesting that, you know, it was the government were involved. This is believed by upwards, you know, of 60, 70% of the US population. And these beliefs have kind of maintained popularity since when it first happened. And of course, back in then, there was no internet. It was more to do with other types of media. It was to do with newspapers. It was to do with audio related content, I guess, which indeed highlights how the internet indeed can make theories flourish, but they're not the cause of those theories. Mm. Without the internet, I'm confident that there would still be COVID-19 conspiracy theories because you know, the rhetoric is still the same. Of course, it wouldn't be spread across Twitter or Facebook. It would be via other platforms, other ways to to, um, communicate information. But with all that said, of course, we still have the internet and we still have the spread of these kind of narratives. But there's no hard evidence to to suggest that people who are always susceptible to conspiracy theories are finding them more or less with the internet. Because arguably, if you're susceptible to believing these type of narratives, you may search out this information, whatever platform you're on. Mm. Another, another argument could be, well, people who maybe would never have searched a conspiracy theory may suddenly find themselves thinking about them more because they're more, you know, in our, in our uh, echo chambers, potentially, mm-hmm. which, you know, certainly could be true. There's no hard data either way. So I can't say for certainly that that happens or not. Mm. I can certainly imagine it happening for some people that if they're exposed to this information, they may find it really appealing and suddenly they find themselves in the, in the rabbit hole. But of course, the internet also has lots of factual information. It's a very diverse you know, ocean of knowledge that if you searched about COVID-19, you'll probably find more factual information from the governments, from from NGOs about COVID than you would do Mm. conspiratorial information. So potentially if you were searching it as, you know, someone new to this topic, I wouldn't suggest that you would get a automatic kind of conspiratorial worldview by just doing a simple Google search. Instead, it potentially is that that myriad of your psychology, which of course we'll get to, and the access of information. So in a way, in that little segment, I've argued both sides of the coin mm-hmm. because I think both are potentially possible. And because we haven't got any strong evidence to suggest either way, I prepare, I suspect it's probably a bit of both. That for some people who want conspiracy theories or that want, shall we say, or susceptible, will find it. And for some people, they may find themselves in that chamber. But there's a lot of other information that's around it that may buffer that impact. So the internet plays a role. It's probably just not as straightforward as we may think. Yeah, and that's very, very fascinating. So it's it's hard to really it's it's hard to make an estimate of how many people believe in conspiracy theories or if it's more or less than before, because I guess it maybe I'm wrong and I'd love to be corrected, but it's almost that believing in conspiracy theories is almost just a a greater evil of maybe old fashioned gossiping or rumour making or having these conversations, looking at people above and wondering what they're thinking, maybe looking at a king and saying, are they thinking of what's best for us, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you used a really interesting phrase there. You said those who may be more susceptible to this. And I think that's something that everyone has been surprised with at some point, particularly over the last two years with COVID-19, is that it's very hard to define what a person who believes in these are, because I've seen, I've noticed, in fact, that it's very intelligent people, a lot of the time sometimes, who speak very well and they're very cleanly pulling together all of this information. It's just obviously there's a, a logical fallacy in there somewhere. But they have to have a level of intelligence. Whilst I feel like people who believe in conspiracy theories a lot of the time are painted as fools and jokers, you know, people who are falling for something. So I I, I don't personally know if it's that straightforward. I don't think people who believe in this are less intelligent. I think it's more complicated. So the question I, I am trying to throw out to you now is, is there a type of person? Is there certain characteristics that would make you more or less vulnerable for believing or falling or even creating conspiracy theories. So there's not a profile of a conspiracy theorist. 
as you kind of mentioned there, it is quite complex. And actually, some may find themselves in that journey for very different reasons, based on the environment, some of their, some of their personality variables that they may have, or indeed a, a merry match of it all. Some of the predictors we know are if you have a strong need to feel unique, you want to feel different, you're more likely to believe in conspiracies. Potentially also, if you feel that you're marginalized, that you're kind of on, on the fringes, you may indeed find you more, more susceptible to engage in this kind of mindset because potentially it's also based on your prior experiences. But that we know if you have received discrimination in the past based on, for example, your sexuality, you may be more susceptible to believe in conspiracies about, for example, HIV, the idea that it's human made. Because again, if you have been marginalized, if people have been able to get you, in other domains, potentially this could make you more conspiratorial. And it's that line of trying to work out, well, what is truth and what is indeed just conspiratorial thinking? And of course, asking questions is really important, but the conspiratorial belief comes in, into play where people seem to have this overriding suspicion of any official account and that they find themselves immune to evidence. So in one hand, it could be correct that you are suspicious of certain people or groups, but this seems to manifest itself in ways that just doesn't make sense for that particular, mm -hmm. you know, grain of truth, shall we say. So prior experiences are potentially plays a role to whether someone may find these narratives really appealing. So whether your experiences of HIV, for example, and, and discrimination may make you look at COVID slightly differently because of discrimination that you have received in, in your lifetime. Other things that could play a role are how you view yourself and your group, but that if you have a real positive view of yourself, if you're a narcissistic, and also if you see your group as being fabulous and wonderful, you also you are likely to believe in conspiracies about the other group, someone who is potentially an air group. A good example of this, of course, is Republicans versus Democrats. They believe in conspiracies about each other because it maintains that group difference, mm. that it's the other group who has been conspiring. So that's why we find that through elections, the other side is always the one who believes in conspiracies. They're always the ones who shout voter fraud and it changes political party depending on who is the loser in a way. And this has been mapped for, for several years that this happens. So around the election in 2020, there was always going to be conspiracy theories. It just depended on which side it landed on. In essence, who won? Mm -hmm. And it would be the other party that would say they are, they are, you know, they've lost because of conspiracy belief, well, because of a conspiracy, which I think indeed highlights the intergroup element that also plays a role, whereby maybe it's the environment, i.e. you find ourselves in a very anxious, a very uncertain environment, which can also breed conspiracy theories, that is then coupled with us maybe feeling a bit marginalised, feel the need that you do, you know, want to be unique, and also offers us a way to, you know, other the other group. The other group mm. are doing bad things. This kind of barrier could all, all come together, potentially. But of course, people will have different elements of those things we've even talked about. So of course, to suggest that one route is for everyone is probably just a bit too, bit too simplistic. Indeed, in reality, probably a mixture of other things playing a role as well. <laughs> we mentioned education and education in general does seem to be uh, more protective of you believing in conspiracies. But as you kind of mentioned, it's not as straightforward. Rather, education means that you develop your critical thinking abilities. It, you develop the appreciation that simple solutions can't explain always complex problems. And rather, it's these skill sets are, are the things that make you less susceptible to believe in conspiracies. So even that simple idea that trying to explain an event as complex as COVID-19 or climate change or whatever, or vaccines, and explain it as some very simple solution that's a government conspiracy, doesn't necessarily always make sense. So that appreciation could offer some buffer to conspiracy theories. So potentially someone indeed could be very educated, but may have not necessarily developed those skill sets, or indeed maybe quite educated, but find that, you know, they're still very anxious. They're still very full and very uncertain that the conspiracy could offer some solace too. So in general, we may find that it's education that is playing a role, but of course, as I say, it's quite complex. And that's why we can probably point at individuals and say, mm. well, why are they involved in conspiracy theories? Well, it's probably because they've got there via a different route. And potentially they are probably maybe not thinking as critically as we would hope they would be. Because we know that people who believe in conspiracies, they subjectively believe that they are being a critical thinker, 
but obje objectively they may be not. They're di digesting information that still supports their belief whilst discrediting other viewpoints, which of course is not necessarily a, being a good critical thinker. Being a good critical thinker is evaluating all evidence and mm. trying to be open to both sides of the coin in essence, rather than just being on one side. So it's kind of a mixture of things there. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It's quite a mixture of things and it's quite a mixture of quite natural you know, basic thinking, cognitive things that are going on there. But and, and just to touch on something you mentioned there, you were talking about group dynamics and echo chambers. And the two things that stood out to me for that, it's almost that with group dynamics, would it be that once you found people who believe this, since there's a group, you're more likely to defend each other and identify with it. And again, it's it's an echo chamber within itself. Once you meet other people who believe you're more likely to believe in the same way that if you have a good friend who tells you something, you're probably more likely to believe it. Would that be correct? That's, that's a really good point. Because of course, if you already feel marginalized, maybe you are going through different circumstances, feeling a part of a community will be really appealing. And indeed, researchers has demonstrated that those who believe in conspiracies about a certain topic do feel that community element mm. that they are in an essence in it together. They are the ones who are trying to, you know, uncover this conspiracy that being a part of QAnon trying to pull down you know the the Peely firing in the White House that would be you know potentially really empowering and even just thinking about going out to protest to protest mm. about COVID-19 about the vaccine in Bill Gates for someone potentially to go out and be in a community of like-minded people whilst I have no data on this I can imagine to be that really empowering yeah. I can imagine that to be fulfilling and actually exciting and in a way kind of embed yourself in that community which for someone who maybe is looking to feel different looking to feel a part of a community could be really appealing so in a way someone who maybe gets involved in these kind of narratives could have a change of identity in a way yeah. indeed that could come their identity where they you know we'd like-minded people so i although as i say i have no data i'd be really keen to even just see the the response of some going out and protesting because we know in other areas of of, of, of protest it can be really motivating you know really empowering so i would suspect it's a similar thing here some benefit in that regard of course there are dangers and actually in reality believe in the conspiracy can actually make you feel more anxious, more uncertain, mm. more, more distrustful, but potentially that community element maybe increases. So it's kind of that, that myriad, isn't it, potentially of feeling part of the community, but then actually you're quite ostracized from everyone else, which mm -hmm. may mean you're then acting in a very you know, unsocial way in essence, which I think is really interesting because we know that with COVID-19, people who believe in conspiracy theories are less likely to want to get the vaccine because they want to protect themselves. They're not getting vaccinated because it, because it may actually harm them, mm -hmm. which I think is also an interesting kind of dynamic to this as well, where people potentially are protecting their own in-group, their own self from this conspiracy, which again is a dangerous thing, but potentially it could be quite a motivating thing to keep you in that community, which when we think about interventions, it could be quite hard to try and change that person because they have that identity, yeah. they have that community. How do you enable someone to feel that that, that kind of uh, connected outside of that conspiracy belief? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I can, I think anything anyone in the world identify with feeling a sense of relax when you meet people who you like and agree with you, or maybe you agree with them and that makes you more likely to like them or something like that. Scrounge break! The red panda is really cute and there are only 10,000 of them left in the wild. Although red pandas are screwed, one good bit of news is that you can keep the podcast alive by donating to patreon.com forward slash living room logic and get loads of exclusive bits. We're going to hell! Before that uh, is the mention of anxiety. So the mention of people who are nervous about something and perhaps they go into these, you know, group settings, these communities of people like minded and that comforts those anxieties. Even, but you did mention as well that it can even make them more anxious. Maybe that's a thing of once you start believing in one thing, you start seeing the world as anything. Any of these could be true. So I'm just wondering, is there something about the anxious mind that makes it more likely to begin conspiracy thinking? Because it would be in 
anxious times, such as with the pandemic and in the past, I'm sure, that people are more likely, I don't know if they have more time on their hands, maybe that's it, but is there something about being more nervous that makes it a breeding ground for conspiracy thinking? Yes, absolutely. And if you think about all the main of six, all the big events that we've talked about, they are in in the core quite anxiety provoking. They're quite threatening. They're, they're uncertain. They make you feel a bit uneasy. They're big events that we want to explain with big causes. So think about again, the example of COVID nineteen when it when it first came into our lives and it still is. It still is a very anxious time where you know people are, people are grappling. Well, what has happened? What is causing this? And a conspiracy belief can offer a very simple explanation for what is that complex problem. And for someone who maybe hasn't got the skill sets to really appreciate that not always simple solutions can always explain complex problems, that rather they're really keen to explain this big event as something equally as big may fall trap to conspiracy theories. So the terrorist attacks, again, very anxious times. You're thinking what's happened. A conspiracy can offer some solace. It can explain, oh, What's happened is actually a government conspiracy. The government's done this. It's not, you know, a, a, a terrorist that is actually really anxiety provoking. It could happen all, you know, anywhere, anytime. But rather, it's something planned. The government has planned this, which actually can make it feel a bit more easy to understand. But they're not satisfying because it can actually increase your anxiety and mm-hmm. your distrust. Because again, if you believe, oh well, the government has been involved in this in this in this, in this event in in the terrorist attack in in climate change in COVID nineteen, well, that actually is not a good thing, is it? Like believing that there's a conspiracy against you is not going to make you feel any any better, arguably. And indeed, evidence has showcased that actually. The anxiety could bring you into the conspiracy, but then it also keeps you there as well because you then feel as anxious as you were at the start, arguably, because, you know, believing that everyone's out to get you is not is not going to comfort you. No. Of course, mentioned potentially you could feel a community element, which, you know, could help with some of the, the needs that we have. But that, those fundamental needs that, you know, also need to address, such as be, to be secure, to be in control, are not going to be addressed. So potentially satisfying, but not appealing, which could explain why people kind of struggle to come out of conspiracy beliefs because it it kind of keeps you in that anxiety state in a way yeah and that yeah it's so so interesting thinking about all the different avenues that make someone more or less likely to believe in these conspiracy theories but i i think something that is actually very important to consider is do they actually matter you know like does it actually matter that people have these beliefs is it harmless because it could just be people shouting into the off the rooftops in a in an empty village you know maybe it's not having a real world impact mm. maybe it is so is there what what is the real world impact of conspiracy theories does it have a downstream impact so a whole range of different outcomes can come from conspiracy beliefs for the individual as we've kind of mentioned, I don't want to try and spend too much time on it again, but of course, someone feeling anxious, you know, feeling on edge is not a good thing for someone's individual well-being. To be feeling in that state, of course, is something that is, you know, detrimental to that person, which I think is something that is worth flagging as well, the impact of the individual. But of course, it's also impact to wider society, whereby if someone's not vaccinating because they, they don't want to put a risk to themselves because they believe Bill Gates potentially is involved, well, that's going to impact mm. wider society. You know, not just, in, not, not just vaccines to do with COVID-19, but vaccines in general. MMR vaccine, for example, is impacting wider society. If I believe that climate change isn't happening, that scientists are faking their data, well, I'm not going to want to reduce my carbon footprint, which again is going to have an impact on not just the individual, but also wider society. Another example I think is worth talking about is if I believe that 5G is the cause of COVID-19, that the government are involved or something shady with, with, you know, IT engineers, well, I'm going to want to call them out on that. It's not that I'm going to sit at home and just think, oh, I can't believe they're doing this. I'm going to be, I want to go, I want yeah. to go out and call them out. I potentially want to go out and stop them doing this to try and stop the spread of COVID-19. And indeed, we, we demonstrated in some work I was involved in that these beliefs can make you feel quite angry. 
potentially. Because again, I can't believe they're doing this. And this anger may then motivate you to go out and actually, in essence, have a violent reaction against those who are seen to be conspiring. So in that example of 5G, it could be setting a 5G pylon on fire as a way to stop that pylon causing mm. COVID-19, which of course mm -hmm. it doesn't do. What it does do actually in reality is it impacts the communication infrastructure, whereby there was, there was examples last year in the UK where, you know, hospitals were, were impacted because of the, you know, the communication infrastructure being set alight. Engineers regularly, even to today, I believe, are still getting abused because they seem to be part of the conspiracy. So this belief doesn't just sit in isolation, rather it can manifest and can, you know, motivate people to want to go out and mm -hmm. have action, which for me, thinking logically makes sense that if someone has this belief, they're going to, going to want yeah. to call them out on that. If someone has the belief that, you know, people who in, in Washington are involved in a paedophile ring, that there's something going on that needs to be called out, that Trump is, is a savior, well, people will be motivated to go and have a riot yeah. at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And did we saw that? Then there, there are countless examples now of people going out and acting on their conspiracy beliefs. In essence, being you know, extremists, being extreme with their viewpoints. And often uh, a lot of terrorist manifestos do have conspiratorial yeah. elements involved where they believe a certain group is doing something sinister against them. So potentially, this is obviously quite an extreme example with, with violence, but I'm sure even the listeners can think of examples of conspiracy beliefs in just the last few months yeah. that have been shown to lead to violence. Of course, it's not everyone. And as, as, I, as I mentioned, with the anger part, it's kind of a process whereby it depends on how someone could regulate their emotions potentially. Mm -hmm by that the conspiracy may make them feel angry, but it depends on a lot their, their personality variables to whether they actually go out and act in that way. So for example, some research found that if someone's moral compass was slightly um, skewed, that they saw kind of taking actions mm -hmm. into their own hands as a legitimate thing to do, they're more susceptible to do that. So of course, you don't have the conspiracy belief, you go out and actually set something alight, or you or you go out and you know you have to do a riot, it's more complicated. But the general premise is there that these beliefs can obviously motivate. So in a way, it's not just impacting whether you vaccinate, so it's also impacting, you know, in essence, intricate relations, whether you are violent towards you know a potential group who is mm. seen to be conspiring. Which goes back to right at the start, where I mentioned that conspirators are not just governments. They are. They can be seen to be different groups of people, such as BT yeah. engineers in the UK, such as Jewish people, such as people who are in, in the Senate in, in, in the US. Again, these people are, are targets, in essence, of this conspiracy, and people can be motivated to go out and, you know, want to call them out on that. Which, of course, if it was true, it's obviously a good thing to be doing. So, of course, for example, paedophile rings do exist, that is true, and people sh should call them out on that, and they should be investigated. But that grain of truth suddenly turns into a paedophile ring being in the in the White House that Trump is trying to, you know, um, highlight. That is when suddenly it's very different to what the truth is, which indeed can bring someone into these beliefs because they, you know, of course, you know, paedophile rings are, you know, a thing that we need to obviously be be, be concerned about. But it suddenly turns into something very different. So. What you always find interesting in me, if you, if you obviously if you ask people about paedophile rings, people are really angry and people are you know really want to do something about them. Um, but then if you ask about the White House, QAnon, obviously not as many people are involved in that element of it. So potentially it's also around um, how you ask someone's conspiracy yeah. belief. That if you ask someone about paedophile rings, you'll get like 60% of people going, I can't believe this. If you ask about paedophile rings in the White House and it's part of a conspiracy, you're looking at more of five ten percent. So still large numbers. I'm not not disputing that, but it depends on the grain of truth that you're asking about. And what you find is that some most conspiracies have that grain of truth, but what the conspiracy actually is is so different yeah. to 
what that started as and that example of the peanut ring is a nice example of something that turning yeah. into something else in essence it's a bit like chinese whispers mm. in a way isn't it? it kind of changes as you kind of go yeah through. no that that makes a lot of sense and i think it kind of ties into blurring the line between what a conspiracy theory is and what misinformation is they kind of they flow together perhaps a conspiracy theory is just a few pieces of misinformation which have been aligned together with red string on someone's wall somewhere and has developed into. So would all of these impacts of conspiracy theories be the same, one of the same as misinformation that we're seeing? Yeah, definitely. So misinformation and conspiracy theories are different because something can be fake and not have the conspiratorial mm. element involved. Indeed, it hasn't got to be a hidden plot by a secret group of people for their own hidden agenda. It can just be yeah, okay. false. It just be not true. So think about some of the myths around COVID-19, around you know, the start of garlic and all the things like, weird things like that. They were just misinformation. It wasn't, it wasn't that it was a, a conspiracy belief behind it. It was just false. Whereas other things, such as, you know, the idea of 5G, that is conspiratorial beliefs because it's someone having a hidden agenda to try and cause COVID-19 which of course is still all false, but potentially could lead to very different actions, I suppose. But I think the general gist, I suppose, is that believing in false information about the vaccine may lead to someone not wanting to vaccinate. Believing in conspiracy theories about the vaccine, similarly, may lead to people not wanting to vaccinate. So potentially the outcome measure could be the same thing, i.e vaccination impacts not well, not, mm -hmm. not vaccinating but the the information itself could be slightly different and of course some of the same factors that draw someone to believe in conspiracies can do the same thing with misinformation so thinking of emotions thinking of of your ability to think critically your ability just to not be in your echo chambers again it's even going down to the fact if you believe misinformation about the group that you mm -hmm. dislike that could be false or it could be conspiratorial again if it meets your view of the world you potentially might subscribe to it so i do think as i say they're different things but depending on the context you may find the same pattern emerges with both the psychology and also the outcome measure, i.e. emotions leading to the belief, also then leading to knowledge yeah, to vaccinate. Yeah, of course, of course. That's, oh, that's all. I, I could talk to you all day. It's absolutely fascinating to think about all of it. And I think just to, just to end it now, and I think it's something everyone has struggled with or has come across at some point, is do you have advice for speaking to people who perhaps believe in a conspiracy theory or in misinformation? Because a lot of the time, and I'm going to go and make a wild guess here. There's a lot of anger in, and it's arguments and attacking each other. And I have a funny feeling that's not the way to talk to people and try to bring them down a little bit. So what would your advice be for speaking to these people? So I think it's worth acknowledging up front. It's a challenge yeah. and that it's not going to be easy. With that said, it's going at someone also with aggression is not going to be a productive conversation. Instead, there's ideas around, in essence, being a trusted messenger building rapport with that person. Rapport in the sense of highlighting the key values that you have. Because of course, I would argue that everyone would think that asking questions is an important part of our society, yeah. to ask questions and to seek information. Mm -hmm. But then the, the myriad comes when people potentially are asking questions, but then are not truly evaluating the information. But they, in essence, are just reading something that supports their viewpoint on Twitter, and then looking no further. So in, in a sense, it's trying to build that rapport of, you know, it's important to ask questions, but also to evaluate. Mm. And in essence, try and get that conversation around of, well, how do you evaluate? What do you do? When you have a strong emotional reaction to something, it makes you happy, or it makes you really angry, what do you do? Do you just share it straight away on, on your feed? Or do you look into it a little bit more? Do you fact check it? Mm -hmm. And potentially talking about the skills around that could open the conversation up. Of course, that is not going in and saying COVID-19 is X, Y, and Z, but rather you're looking more abstract at it. You're trying to understand that person's way to navigate the social world. With the idea being that if we try and embed these skills and make people aware, in essence, of the echo chambers, could it help them think a bit more differently about the information? 
which then may lead to conversations where you can talk about how this makes them feel, what what some of the what kind of benefits do they have by believing in this, this information, and vice versa. Talk about the same thing on the other side, which could then lead to a bit more productive conversation, which could then lead to maybe debunking later on. But of course, it's a kind of a slow process. By if you just went straight in and argued why you are right, of course, it's not going to work. But instead, if you try and think about it more as trying to understand what you do have in common and trying to work from there, it could be a slightly better conversation. But as I said at the start of this, this segment, it's challenging. And yeah. it's for someone who potentially has this viewpoint, who maybe feels part of a community. It's trying to get them to feel that community element, but elsewhere. So like a really interesting point someone mentioned a little while ago was trying to change potentially someone's interests and identity. Yeah. Like that. If someone potentially is highlighting that they're interested in other hobbies, maybe try and help them foster that other hobby, which may then make <laughs> them be less less needy towards the conspiracy community because they can they can able to develop a community elsewhere. Okay. Again, just the idea that which I thought was quite interesting. But I do think identity is kind of a key part mm. that potentially just putting someone and giving them you know a paragraph on the success of vaccines may not work for yeah. them instead it's going to be more of a conversation getting them to think about the evidence and to evaluate and in essence to empower them to find the myriad of of truth in essence think about the consensus you know climate change if you were to search the consensus around what the scientists think, the overall majority will say it's happening. Yeah. And indeed that has to mean something. So a similar thing is trying to find the consensus of a topic where maybe you don't have the expertise in it. That's good advice. It's a lot better than uh, just shouting at people or getting angry or uh, throwing <laughs> water at protesters on the street. Uh, you know, so that's all great. Now, thank you very much, Daniel, for coming on and telling us all about the psychology behind conspiracy theories. It was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the end of the podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time. If you're feeling generous and you're not completely skinned, why don't you give us some of your money? Join our Patreon Join our Patreon Join our Patreon Join our Patreon